So Team Grace, I'd like to go right back to our homily series, those two strands, walking through the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the section on the Eucharist there in part two of the Catechism, and then walking through the different parts of the Mass. And normally I start with the parts of the Mass and then move to the Catechism. But last week I paused the Catechism, so I'd like to start there this week, because I'd like to cover actually two numbers. So if you have your Catechism with me, you can join me in number 1336 excuse me, 1346. So if you have your catechisms, number 1346. But before diving into the catechism, let me ask you, Team Grace, how many main parts are there of the catechism? Four. All right, and everyone can answer this. What's the first part? The second part? The third? The fourth? Exactly, Team Grace, that's very important. So if you want to know more about the rosary, say, gosh, I prayed the rosary when I was younger. I haven't really prayed the rosary much. I prayed the rosary. I don't really know if I fully understand it. You want to know more about the rosary. What part of the catechism would you go to? Right. So you had a moral question. Like, you weren't sure. Like, why does the church not support in vitro fertilization? What's that about? Right? You want to understand what the church is thinking. What part of the catechism would you go to? Morals. Exactly. What about if you wanted to know about, more about the incarnation of the Son of God? The fact that God became a man. You see, we celebrate that at Christmas, but we've allowed a lot of fake things and stories to cover that, to eclipse what's really happening at Christmas. So maybe you're having an awakening in your faith. You're like, I really want to understand more about that. What part of the catechism would you go to? The creed, exactly. What about if you were thinking, man, I was baptized as a child. It sounds like baptism was really important. <laughs> the most important day of my life, and I don't even remember it, right? And, I, and you want to know more about baptism, what part of the catechism would you go to? Sacraments, exactly. So, Team Grace, you have the inner structure of the catechism of the Catholic Church. And that is the vast, you have more knowledge now, the vast majority, you have more knowledge than the vast majority of Catholics uh, today. You know, there are still Catholics who don't even know that there's a catechism of the Catholic Church. But here at Our Lady of Grace, no, we want every Christian home to have a copy of the Bible and a copy of the catechism of the Catholic Church. It is very important that as Christians you understand our faith, that you study and seek to understand our faith. So while as a parish we're walking through the sec second part on the Eucharist, wherever the Holy Spirit might be leading you, I'm going to encourage you to go there. So maybe the Holy Spirit has you in the fourth part on prayer, or the first part on the creed, or maybe there's some moral things you're figuring out. Wherever the Holy Spirit is leading you, the most important thing is that you are in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that you're studying and seeking to know our faith. So with that, let's go to number 1346. 1346 reads, The liturgy of the Eucharist unfolds according to a fundamental structure which has been preserved throughout the centuries down to our own day. Did you know that, Team Grace? That the fundamental structure of the Holy Mass has been intact since the Lord Jesus gave it to us in the upper room. For over 2,000 years, the fundamental structure of the Mass has remained the same. Now, the ceremonies surrounding the Mass have changed. Some are older Catholics remember that most recently happened in the 1960s. There were some changes to the ceremonies of the Mass, or the language of the Mass. But the fundamental structure has remained intact. Since the Lord gave us this gift in the upper room, all through the ages, it has remained the same. The Catechism continues. It displays two great parts that form a fundamental unity. The gathering, the liturgy of the Word, with readings, homily, and general intercessions. The liturgy of the Eucharist, with the presentation of the bread and wine, the consecratory thanksgiving, and communion. So how many parts are there of the Mass, Team Grace? Four. Four. What's the first part? What's the second part? Exactly. And then we know the third part is the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist, as we're hearing here from the Catechism, those are the two main parts of the Mass. And these two main parts form a fundamental unity. So do two different parts, but they have to be together. The Catechism continues. The Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist together form one single act of worship. The Eucharistic table set before us is a table both of the Word of God and the body of the Lord. Now that's important for us to understand, Team Grace, because I've stressed that as Catholics, we kind of just dismiss the Liturgy of the Word, almost as if it's just a prelude to the Liturgy of the Eucharist. But here the Catechism of the Catholic Church, when we are fed at Mass, we are first fed from the table of God's Word. And then we are fed at the table of the Lord's body. We have to make sure we understand the liturgy of the Word and its importance. That there are two main parts that form one fundamental act of worship. 
The Catechism continues in 1347. The Catechism asks this question. Is this not the same movement of the Paschal meal of the risen Jesus with his disciples? Now that's a peculiar question that's actually making a statement. That the fundamental structure of the Mass is the fundamental structure of the Passover meal. Now we've spoken before, why is it that of all the high feast days of God's people in the Old Covenant, why did the Lord Jesus choose the Passover in which to give us the new and everlasting covenant? He could have chosen any of other feast days, but he chose the Passover. Remember, he chose that because the Old Testament Passover was the dress rehearsal of what he was going to accomplish. That God was going to come and ransom us from slavery, bring us to the desert and the workings of his grace, in order to welcome us into the promised land of heaven. So everything that happened in the Old Testament Passover, he's going to fulfill. So the Lord chose that feast day and that, fe that Passover meal in order to give us the new and everlasting covenant. And the fundamental structure of the Passover meal is the same as the Mass. Now that should rock your world when you realize, wait a minute, so what the Lord Jesus gave us in the upper room has remained intact for over 2,000 years and it's exactly what we're celebrating today. Yes, amen. That's exactly it. So we can see an unbroken chain of the worship of God, the offering and the representation of the Lord's sacrifice to God the Father. And the baptized throughout the generations have participated in that sacrifice. The Catechism continues. Walking with them, he explained the scriptures to them. Sitting with them at table, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. The other Catechism is drawing from Luke chapter 24, the famous story of the two disciples on their way to Emmaus. And the early fathers told us that St. Luke, when he wrote the story of the Emmaus, he was actually summarizing the whole of Christian life. We walk with Jesus on the way. He teaches us by the sacred scriptures. He feeds us and encounters us in the breaking of the bread. And then he sends us out in mission to announce to the world what he has done. The early fathers also went on to say that St. Luke was describing even the worship of the Christian community. That we come from different places along the way. There we have the breaking of God's word and the breaking of his bread. And then he sends us out on mission. So here the Catechism is showing us that the early church, even from the time of St. Luke recounting the work of the, of, of the early community in the Acts of the Apostles, that the tact, the structure of the Mass has remained intact. That this fundamental structure is passed on and on through, through the generations. Now this is important for us because we have to realize that the church didn't make this up. The church does not have the authority to change the fundamental structure of what the Lord has given to us. This is a gift given to us by the Lord Jesus in the upper room as he began his passion. And that through all the generations, that sacrifice has continued and been passed from one generation to the next and will continue until the Lord returns in glory. We, the baptized, have the opportunity, the privilege of participating in this sacrifice. My goodness, there's more in the catechism. So much more to be said. As a parish family, we're going to continue to walk through the catechism. But those are just two numbers for this weekend. And again, Team Grace, I'm going to encourage you to pray to the Holy Spirit and go where he leads you in terms of the catechism of the Catholic Church. Because I know that God wants to teach us. We are the children of God. We're not orphans. He doesn't want us playing guessing games. He wants to teach us and instruct us. So I would encourage you, follow the Holy Spirit and open up the catechism of the Catholic Church and make sure you are studying and seeking to know our faith. Okay, that's the catechism of the Catholic Church. Now let's shift to the parts of the Mass. Remember that the Second Vatican Council called on pastors to make sure that the faithful can actively and consciously participate in the sacrifice? And that's one of the reasons why, in honor of this National Eucharistic Revival, we're going through the different parts of the Mass. Because truth be told, the Second Vatican Council asked for that over 50 years ago, and it was not done. Instead, you were given a lot of cotton candy, and the parishes were turned into circuses. Everything exploded in terms of activity, a lot of activity. I remember one wise spiritual writer said, be careful when there's a lot of activity because it usually indicates nothing is getting done. Huh? And that's exactly what happened. There was a lot of activity, but the work that was being called for was not done. The faithful were not taught about the Mass. The Mass changed, the ceremonies changed, the language changed, but the faithful were never taught. The work of the council was never fulfilled. Here at Our Lady Grace, we're picking up that mantle. 
I, as your pastor, very much want to make sure that you understand the parts of the Mass, that you actively and consciously participate at the Mass. If you're still of the mindset that you can pop in here in 45 minutes, get out, and you're just checking the box, and you don't know why the priest is talking so long, and why does he use the longer forms of the prayer, then we have some work to do. Because as the psalmist says, one day in your house, O oh Lord, are like a thousand everywhere else. And that's how we have to understand it. This is the most important thing we do all week. Why are you rushing this? Why is it you just can't, you can't wait to get out? Convert your heart before the Lord and realize in whose presence you are. In large part, as a help, you have to know what's going on. Admittedly, if we don't know what's going on, we all get bored. Our minds go somewhere else. But no, when we're in this place and we're doing this sacred action, our minds, our hearts have to be on the Lord. So we're walking through the different parts of the Mass. Right now, we're still in the liturgy of the Word. So we went through the first reading and the psalm and why the Old Testament was important. We spoke about that second reading from one of the New Testament apostolic letters. And then we spoke about the Alleluia verse and why that's so important. And we spoke about the Gospel proclamation. And then last week, we spoke about the liturgical homily. <laughs> I had some things to say about that, didn't I? But you know what? Now that you know about the liturgical homily, you can understand why the creed follows the homily. Why does Mother Church on Sundays and Holy Days have us say the creed? And why is the creed right after the homily? Couldn't we just pray the creed, the creed privately sometime else? Or if it has to be at the Mass, why does it have to be right after the homily? But now that you understand the apostolic preaching and the liturgical homily, you can see why. Because St. Paul tells us that the fruit of apostolic preaching is conviction. Listen to this. The Apostle of the Gentiles, one of our most preeminent preachers, said that the gift of apostolic preaching is conviction. What is the fruit of apostolic preaching? What is it again? So let me ask you, if you walk out of this sacred place and you've heard a homily, and you just think that you're just warm fuzzy, and you're just the greatest thing since sliced bread, and you're good to go, has the sacred minister fulfilled his duty? No. If you just walked out with cutesy stories and a bunch of jokes, and that's all he's given you, has he fulfilled his sacred duty? No. We want you to walk out of here and know that you are loved by God, that his mercy is boundless, but to know that we, you are a work in progress, we are works in progress. You should walk out of here and know in your heart that there's something you have to work on, something you have to bring on, take on, something you have to go deeper in, that the fruit of apostolic preaching is conviction. You should walk out because the Holy Spirit has convicted you in something that you are called to do, whether that's to give mercy or work on your prayer life or read the sacred scriptures or serve the poor or the sick, whether it's to reach out a family, to a family member, whatever it might be, the Holy Spirit will convict you through apostolic preaching and you should walk out and know that's the work I have to do. Now once you begin to understand that, that the fruit of apostolic preaching is conviction, you can see clearly why Mother Church has the creed follow the homily. Because if the deacon or priest has fulfilled his duties, you are ready, after the homily and the gospel proclamation, you are ready to stand and announce publicly, I believe. I believe. To announce in the midst of this assembly, I believe. And to leave this sacred place and to announce to a secular world, I believe. For you have been convicted by God's Spirit. You stand up and you say, I believe in God the Father, I believe in God the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit. You say your whole life is marked by that belief. We can say colloquially that the creed is the altar call of the Catholic Church. Huh? You ever notice the Protestant communities they have altar calls? That always confuses me because they don't have altars, right? But they come up and they rededicate themselves to Jesus. Well, our altar call every Sunday and Holy Day is the creed. That after hearing the Word of God explained and please God, the Holy Spirit convicting you, you stand up publicly professing, I believe. And dear friends, as we speak about the creed, it's important that we understand its value and its importance. Do you know it took our early fathers almost 800 years to give us the creed? Constant discernment, prayer and fasting, constant work was being done in order to give us the creed. Whenever all the bishops of the world come together in order to resolve a question, that's called an ecumenical council. There have only been 21 ecumenical councils in our entire history. 2,000 years, 21 ecumenical councils. The last council, the 21st, was the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s. 
Some of our older parishioners will remember that. In order to get us the creed, it took eight ecumenical councils. Eight. Every time they got together and the bishop said, okay, good, here's the creed, right after that, someone would challenge it or redefine a word or say that the Greek actually meant something else and what it meant and so on, and the early bishops would have to get back together. Seven times they came together in order to give us the creed. Those seven ecumenical councils are so important that in our tradition we call them the sacred seven. You know, some of those ecumenical councils were held before we had a formalized New Testament. The early fathers were discerning what the apostles had passed on to their successors, and they were trying to reflect upon what the Lord Jesus had given to us, what he had taught us. And they were trying to clearly explain that God is one, that, he, that the second person of the Trinity became a man, a massive mystery, God infinitely above us, beyond us in his majesty. We have to try to explain that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the mystery of the Holy Trinity, that the second person of the Trinity became a man and dwelt among us. How do you explain that? And that is 100% God and 100% man. He's not 50-50. And he exists within one person without confusion or division. And then we have the Holy Spirit. One whole ecumenical council had to be called because the Christians were saying, well, we like the Father and the Son, but nah, the Holy Spirit's not God. The bishop's like, okay, we've got to get back together again, guys. And they had to come back together and say, no, the Holy Spirit is God. There's three persons in God. A lot of work, a lot of prayer, a lot of fasting was done in order for us to have clarity. It was so important to our early fathers that we understand exactly who Jesus Christ is, who God is. And that work was done so that we might have that clarity. Because, dear friends, we stake our lives on what we profess in the creed. We announce publicly what we believe and our entire life's project is ordering our life according to that belief. You know, our mystics have told us powerful things of the creed. Almost every saint depicted here has some powerful story or mystical vision about the creed. Let me just point to St. Therese, the little flower. St. Therese was dying of serious diseases at the age of 24. And she was given visions that the creed were going to, was going to be violently attacked. So she began to offer up all her sufferings for us, for future generations of believers, that we, were, that we might remain faithful to the creed. She even took the blood that she was coughing up from her illness, and with her own blood she wrote on the wall next to her bed, she wrote out the entire creed, showing that she was giving her life as an oblation for the perseverance in faith of future generations. She saw what was coming, an age of utilitarianism and secularism, an age of atheism and agnosticism, when so many of the human family will turn and say, I don't believe in the creed anymore. When so many, even within the household of the church, would say, I don't believe in the creed. And of course, St. Therese offered her own sufferings for us. We should look at the creed and understand, this is our summary. This is our rule of life. This is what we are called to believe and how we are called to live. Now, as we begin to understand the importance of the creed and why it's placed where it is and where we received it, I hope that deepens our appreciation. That we begin to realize that the creed is a prayer. That when we stand up, we should be praying that and understanding clearly what we are saying. I also have to speak about the practicality of the creed. You know, there are some Catholics who like to bring in other gestures within our worship. I've spoken before about when I say, the Lord be with you, and people want to say, and with your spirit. Don't do that. Where'd, where'd you get that? Leave that in the parking lot. That is not a part of our tradition. Where'd that come from, right? People are just introducing gestures into the Catholic Mass. We don't do that. We are Catholics. We are people of tradition. We are people of the New Testament. We don't do that. But what's interesting is people want to add gestures, but then they don't do the gestures that the church asks us to do. They don't do the gestures that are within our tradition. So let me explain just two of them. The simple bow and the profound bow. First of all, the simple bow. Do you realize that Mother Church asks us that when we hear certain sacred things, we're supposed to bow our heads. Not simply here in worship, but also, also in the midst of the world. So for example, when we hear the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we give a head bow. When we hear the holy name of Jesus, we give a head bow. When we hear the name of Our Lady, we give a head bow. When we hear the saint of the day, so the saint on his or her feast day, they get a head bow. And once you begin to do this practice, if you go to work and you have that person who always likes to use the Lord's name in vain, when they start doing that, just give a head bow. 
They say that, just give a head bow. That will say more than a thousand words, huh? Every time they use a blasphemous, you, they, they use the Lord's name in a blasphemous way, you just give a head bow. Again, that's a public witness. But here in worship, we're supposed to be doing that. Let's practice this. Huh? Roll up our sleeves, jump in, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ. The Blessed Virgin Mary. Bravo, Team Grace. See, we do that here. We're supposed to do it during worship and then take that with you in the midst of the world. That when you hear the name of God, the name of our Lord, and the name of our Lady, you give a head bow because that name means something to you. It means something to us as believers. But then we also have the profound bow. You know, the profound bow, it's used in different occasions, but especially whenever we recall the incarnation of God. We revere especially the fact that God became a man. Again, we celebrate that at Christmas, but you know what? We've allowed mythical figures to eclipse Christmas. There are Christian families that go through the Christmas season and sometimes they don't even talk about Jesus. Or they don't even speak about the fact that God became a man, one of the central mysteries of our faith. Whenever we speak about the Incarnation, we give a profound bow. That's all the way from the waist. We give it all the way down. <laughs> well, at least as far as we can go, right? <laughs> we do our best. That's why during the Angelus before Mass, when we have that third part, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, we give a profound bow or genuflection if we can. You know, during the Mass, Mother Church asked us during the Creed, when we recall the Incarnation, we're supposed to give a profound bow. That we speak of, and God became a man and dwelt among us. That he was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, and then we say he became a man. I was thinking of it this way, he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, and became man. So it was like he came down, and it was like, okay, good, like a man, right? That was, that's when it was like, those are my cues, right? Team Grace, can I push you beyond your comfort zone? Can I ask you to stand up? Let's practice this. Go and stand up, it's okay. Let's give a profound bow to the altar. Excellent, bravo, please be seated. I want to encourage you to begin to do the profound bow during the creed. I want it to be so profound that if someone were walking off the streets and not know what's happening, they could look inside here and say, I don't know what they're talking about, I don't know what they're saying, but I know something sacred is happening because this entire community is, a, is, is in a profound bow honoring something. And they can look and say, that's something sacred. And as we make the profound bow in our own hearts, we can be reflecting on that mystery. God became a man. He became one of us. He redeemed us from the inside out. He came among us, loved with the human heart, cried with human tears, and worked with human hands. And we bow at that mystery of the love that God has for us, that he would come and walk among us. So that's the creed there, friends. Now next week we're going to talk about the prayers of the faithful, and we're going to continue our walk through the Mass. But for now I'm going to encourage you. Make sure you're reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and make sure you are actively and consciously participating in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass.